If 70 years ago, you had asked your grandparents, maybe your great-grandparents, maybe your great-great-grandparents, <clears throat> what the world needs now, not, it's not, the answer is not love, 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 that's your parents, but <laughs> the grandparents, the great-grandparents, what the world needs now, the answer they would have given is democracy. The turn of the last century, just a handful of countries were democracies. And the great dream of people after the Second World War was, if we could just spread democracy around the world, the world would be a happy place. And indeed, for most of the 20th century, there was an extraordinary explosion of democracy around the world, so that by the end of the 20th century, there was an incredible number of countries who could claim that they were democracies, and the belief was we therefore had rule by the people. But any honest accounting of the nature of government around the world right now is ruled by the people, not so much. <laughs> so what I want to do today is to give you a sense of why that's true, not in countries like the Ukraine, or not in countries that think about this in a traditional way, but in countries like my own. I want to describe it for you and to give it a name. So here's where we start. We start right here in Vilnius. I want you to imagine us taking a drone about 10,000 kilometers west, a little bit south, ending up in the town of El Paso, Texas. And then I want you to imagine getting into your Apple time machine and going back by about 90 years in El Paso, Texas, till you come to old El Paso, Texas. And when you get to old El Paso, go downtown, and if you do go downtown in old El Paso, Texas, you might run into this man, Dr. Lawrence Nixon. Nixon was an extraordinary physician. 1910, he moved to El Paso, and every two years between 1910 and 1922, he walked to the polling place in El Paso, paid his poll tax, and voted. But in 1924, when he went to pay his poll tax and vote, he was told by the registrar, Dr. Nixon, you know you can't vote. And he said, I know I can't, but I've got to try. And the reason he couldn't is that in 1923, Texas had enacted a law, a statute, that said explicitly, that the Democratic primary was an all-white primary. By law, explicitly, only whites could vote in the Democratic primary. The Democratic Party was the only party in Texas. So what that meant was Texas had created a two-stage process. There was a general election where all citizens in principle, white or black, could vote, but there was a white primary. And to run in the general election, you had to run in the white primary. You had to win in the right primary. So there was a two-stage process with this filter in the middle a filter which excluded a significant chunk of Texas's population in this critical first step of the election with the consequence, obviously, of producing a democracy responsive to whites only. Okay, what Texas did wasn't actually invented by Texas. It was probably this man, Boss Tweed, who ran the criminal political organizations in New York who invented this technique. Tweed used to say, I don't care who does the electing as long as I get to do the nominating. So Boss Tweed was a figure who understood exactly <laughs> how to create a democracy that he could subvert. And we should call his theory Tweedism. Tweedism. And Tweedism is any end stage, let's just say two-stage democracy, where the Tweeds control the first stage before the rest of us get to participate in the second stage. And that first stage thus creates a filter, a filter, so that the Tweeds exercise their control over the way the democracy works. That's what Tweedism is. And the consequence of Tweedism, obviously, is a system responsive to the Tweeds, whoever the Tweeds are, but the Tweeds only. So think about the protests that broke out in Hong Kong last summer. Kids from across Hong Kong, and then eventually their parents, showed up to protest the proposed law that China had for selecting the chief executive in Hong Kong, a law that said the ultimate aim is the selection of the chief executive by a universal suffrage upon nomination by a broadly representative nominating committee in accordance with democratic procedures. Nomination 
by a committee comprised of 1,200 citizens, which means out of 7 million people in Hong Kong, about 0.02% of Hong Kong got to participate in the stage that selected the candidates who got to run in the general election. Now, 0.02% is really tiny. There it is. See how small that is up there? If you imagine a person out of all the people in Hong Kong, it would be exactly one out of every 5,000 people would have the right to participate in the selection of the candidates who would run in the general election. This is an example of tweetism, and that tweetism is what triggered the strike. Because what people in Hong Kong believed was that that first stage was a biased filter. Biased because the 1,200 would be dominated by a pro-Beijing business and political elite, with the consequence, obviously, of producing a democracy that would be responsive to China, not Hong Kong only. Now, I think these cases are obvious. We all get them. So then consider this case. In America today, we take it for granted that political campaigns will be privately funded. But the funding of political campaigns is its own contest. It's its own primary. Members of Congress and candidates for Congress spend anywhere between 30 and 70 percent of their time raising money to get back to Congress or to get their party back into power, dialing for dollars, calling people across the country they've never met, begging them for the money they need to run their campaigns. And as they do this, they learn what works. They learn the techniques that convince people to give them money. They develop a sixth sense, a constant awareness about how what they do will affect their ability to raise money. They become, in the words of the X-Files, shapeshifters as they constantly adjust their views in light of what they know will help them to raise money, not on issues 1 to 10, but on issues 11 to 1,000. Leslie Byrne, a Democrat from Virginia, describes that when she went to Congress, she was told by a colleague, quote, always lean to the green. And to clarify, she went on, you know, he was not an environmentalist. <laughs> so B.F. Skinner from the Harvard uh, Psychology Department gave us this image of the Skinner box, the Skinner box, where we could demonstrate how any stupid animal could learn which buttons it had to push to get the sustenance it needed to survive. This is a picture of the modern American congressperson. As they learn which buttons they must push to survive to get their candidacy successfully back into office. This is a primary two. It is the money primary, not a white primary, but a green primary. It is one stage in a multi-stage election, the critical first stage that decides, that determines who gets to run. And the filter that this money primary creates, this filter is biased. And it's biased because of who the funders of these campaigns are, the funders. In the 2014 election cycle, 5.4 million Americans gave even a dollar to any congressional campaign. That means less than 2% gave even a dollar. But the top 100 gave as much as the bottom 4.75 million funders of that campaign. Those are the biggest funders. But what we should think about is the relevant funders, the people who give enough to be relevant to the candidates as they're thinking about which way they need to shape shift to assure they get the money they need to win their campaigns. So let's say we take the number of $5,200. That's the maximum amount you can give to one candidate in the United States, $5,200. In 2014, there were 57,854 Americans who gave $5,200. And for those of you doing the math, what you might have figured out is 50,854 Americans turns out to be 0.02% of America. 0.02% dominating this first stage, this tiny fraction of the 1%. We could say a Chinese fraction of the 1% dominate this first stage of the election with a consequence, obviously, of producing a democracy responsive to the funders only. Now, I'm a Harvard professor. This is a Princeton study. I'm not allowed to talk about Princeton studies, so let me put that off the stage as quickly as I can. By Martin Gellens and Ben Page, the largest empirical study of actual policy decisions by our government in the history of political science. And they related those decisions to the views of the economic elite, organized interest groups, and the average voter. 
And what they found is, if you map the decisions to the attitudes of the economic elite, as the percentage of the economic elite who support a policy change goes up, the probability of that policy change being enacted goes up as well. Same thing for organized interest groups. As the number of organized groups supporting a policy change goes up, the probability of that policy change happening goes up as well. Okay, here's the graph for the average American voter. It's a flat line. A flat line. What that means is that it doesn't matter what percentage of the average American support a particular policy change, it doesn't change the probability that that policy change will be enacted. As they describe this in English, when the preferences of economic elites and the stands of organized interest groups are controlled for, the preferences of the average American appear to have only a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact on public policy. Okay, this is a profound indictment of a democracy. This is the picture we have of democracy, right? You know, this is kind of the average American from the middle of the country, right? The average American sitting at the steering wheel, we the people at the steering wheel, the idea is we would steer the democracy in the direction we want, but here's the reality of the way this democracy is actually functioning. <laughs> the wheel has been detached from the axles. We no longer control the way the car goes. This is the product of tweedism. Okay, I want you to see three things now that I've described this idea of tweedism. Number one, tweedism is a form of corruption too. I don't mean the corruption of bribery. I'm not talking about the corruption of crimes, money laundering, any of the things that were discussed in the previous really fantastic presentation today. Not the corruption that Transparency International focuses on when they draw this map with its indictment of the vast majority of countries as being corrupt. That's not what tweedism is. What tweedism is, is systemic corruption. It's a corruption of the system, a corruption of representative democracy. Because when we think about this corruption, we should recognize that both legal and illegal corruption exists, and both of them cheat democracy. And so when we look at a map like this, what we should actually be doing is recognizing that this country, too, needs to be colored in red, so that we see the full picture of the way corruption defeats the objective of democracy. That's number one. Number two, tweedism is inequality. Inequality. It manifests the unequal status of citizens within a democracy. Because this unequal vote, not the vote in the ballot election, but in the money election, not in the general election, but in the green primary, this unequal vote denies equal standing to citizens. It denies the equality. Unequal vote means unequal citizens. And point number three, this fight against tweedism is part of a much bigger fight. We should recognize, we should talk about, we should begin to celebrate the explosion of a global anti-corruption movement. And countries across the world, from Brazil to Israel to India to Russia to Ukraine to the United States, there are movements developing from the grassroots up to demand a government responsive to the people. Now, as you look at that range of countries, there are different corruptions in each of these countries. But what unites these different corruptions is the recognition of the fundamental inequality those corruptions produce. Inequality. The inequality that all corruption is. The common failure across these democracies is this inequality, even if there are different causes for the corruption in these different democracies. Now, what's not clear in this fight, what's not clear is whether we can win. Social psychologists describe what they call the bystander effect. The bystander effect says, as the number of people who recognize a tragedy or a disaster increases, the probability that they will actually do something about it goes down. And the reality is, most people in most democracies recognize that democracy is not working. 
And so as most people recognize it, it becomes harder and harder to imagine people standing up and doing something about it. It's not clear we can win. But what is clear is that this is how democracies grow old. They grow old by allowing a tiny fraction to build the infrastructure so that they control what we the people are meant to control. So as I come to this incredibly beautiful country, the first time I've had a chance to be here, though I've been across most of this part of the world many, many times before, this is what I have to you. Stay young. In this democracy, stay young. And more importantly, help us to become young again. <laughs> help us to become young again. Because the truth is, as much as my government would deny it, the truth is, we have lost the capacity to govern. We, the people in America, have lost the capacity to govern, and that should scare you. Because there's not just one drunk grizzly bear on the world today. There are at least two drunk grizzly bears <laughs> on the world stage today. And unless we can find a way to recover that control of we, the people, over our government, our drunk grizzly bear will be as dangerous as any. Thank you very much. Thank you.